it's not just COVID, obviously. Um, not just COVID, obviously, but but everything else that we've gone through, and 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 really, um, you know, over the summer for the city of San Jose with with the the protests and and, and the aftermath, um, you know, and and I think um, it brings us to this place and time that we are right now. Um, I, I want to assure you that this time uh, spent working on this will not be a waste of time. This is not a check the box process for us. Um, we have sincere commitment to doing this work. Um, okay, if you come into it a little skeptical about that, totally fine, I get it. Um, but you know, the proof will be in the work that we do. Um, and and that's, that's the way I always work. And so that's where we're gonna continue to work. Um, but I assure you, it will not be a waste of time. Um, you know, I think, um, Recognizing the fact that there is distrust, uh, you know, in our community um, around uh, our, our policing and and our, our city government, in fact, um, and those things are those things are real, and we can't, you know, we, we don't want to avoid those things. We need to take those things head on. Um, so we have this this great opportunity here. Um, you know, we, you have joining me today as uh, Jennifer, our, our assistant city manager. Um, We've got uh, Zoma, uh, the director of uh, the Office of Racial Equity. Uh, we've got Carolina, the director of uh, communications uh, in the manager's office. Um, we have Chief Mata, we have Chief Tyndall, we have Chief Randall here, um, all, all committed to doing this work. Um, you know, I, I also want to share with you that, you know, I, I have a tremendous amount of confidence in our police department. Um, I know it to be a department, especially the men and women in the department that care about our community. Um, they care about the work that they do and, and, but they also know, you know, we have things that we can learn and do better. And, and that, and that's what this is about. So we won't be approaching this from a defensive standpoint. We won't, you know, we, we've got things to do. We've got things to learn. We've got things to change. And that's the approach we're going to be taking, um, and I'll just go back to where we started. Very grateful that you're all willing to take your time to help us with this work. Um, couldn't, couldn't be more grateful with that. Um, I'm gonna say that and, and end with that and turn it back over to Angel and, and, and look forward to connecting with you more as, as, as we work through all of this. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, and uh, you know, I, I know we have, um, we have an hour and a half together and we'll just quickly go over the agenda real quickly to kind of give you a sense of how we'll spend that time. Um, and uh, it, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty loaded agenda. And, uh, and I'll just say at the front end, whatever we don't get through or finish on this one here, we'll transfer over to the next one, but um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll follow next with a little bit of context, background goals, kind of how we got here. What's the thinking. Um, then really the bulk of this time is really, getting to know you. Uh, I know many of us know each other, but there's some people that don't. And, and I think the operative word in this whole effort is community. And so I think, um, you know, the best way to start this off is to actually make sure that we actually get to know one another. Um, and then of course, we'll, we'll, we'll go into briefly just into some of the proposed values and guiding principles, some of the methodology and the process that we've been thinking about, uh, wanting to get your input before we solidify any of that framework. Uh, and then time permitting, uh, get into a, a, a brief discussion leading to our next meeting around how we begin to prepare ourselves for action. Um, and then, and this is a, a public meeting because this group is advisory to the city manager. This is considered a public meeting under the Sunshine Act. And so uh, there, there, is a, there will be a public comment uh, section under this. We purposely didn't do a whole lot of um, invite uh, and blasting of the meeting because we really see this first meeting more as an onboarding, more as a, you know, kind of, you know, kind of just kicking this off with the um, with the advisory group. Uh, but future meetings will be doing much more community outreach in terms of just letting people know. But so with that, let, let me let me shift gears into uh, how we got here. And, and Dave, you know, really framed it real well, you know, in terms of some of some of the background. Um, and, you know, and as if the pandemic wasn't enough, you know, uh, we know that um, in incidents and issues such as, uh, you know, uh, you know, Jacob Blake and Breonna Taylor and, and George Floyd 
really, um, r really, uh, although it, these these incidents happen in other parts of the country, they still struck a nerve in our community, right? And and what it told us, as evidenced by the by, by the social justice uh, marches that we that we uh, you know experienced over the course of the summer. It told us that San Jose is not exempt from this heated conversation, right? Um, and so, so we're 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 really embracing that, and we want to make sure that we don't waste the pain tied with those incidences, right? Um, and to make sure that we really keep ourselves honest and really ask ourselves, well, you know, what do we need to contend with? What do we need to reconcile? What do, you know? What do, how should we act? How, what should we do as a as a community? And so, so that really served as kind of the, the really the impetus and the catalyst for, for really this conversation around reimagining community safety. Um, and we also recognize that, you know, there are so many divergent perspectives around this issue, right? I mean, this is obviously heated, it's an emotional issue, and it's not an easy one to have. And so our, our thinking is that it is let's pull together really a cross section of the community and let's engage in candid dialogue and let's engage in, in productive you know, disagreement so that we could really you know, kind of confront the issues that we need to confront and then frame them in public policy kind of decision points and then take action more importantly, right? And so that's really what we plan to do over the, over the course of the next six months uh, in partnership with you all. Now, of course, we couldn't invite everybody, right? Uh, and so we really view your roles as really being serving as ambassadors to other constituencies that we we also need to uh, pull into this conversation, right? We recognize that a 40 plus board or, or group isn't gonna capture every single, but, but if you look around these screens, you all have a constituency, you all have influence, you all have a, a spirit of leadership that, uh, that only you could tap into and you and your network, right? And so that's really what we wanna capitalize on is really using you and your subject matter expertise and your care for this issue really as, uh, in addition, as an additional conduit to the rest of the community to make sure that we're tapping into all voices, right? Not just the, not just the, the, the most common ones or the, or, or the most um, frequent ones, but those that really have something to say and never have a chance to say it. Um, and so that all led to, to really a conversation with uh, the mayor and council and, and Dave and, 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 and others around, well, what are we gonna do about this in San Jose? So in June of 2020, uh, uh, the city council did direct uh, uh, um, our administration to, uh, to establish this process. And, and I wanna point out one significant nuance or one shift because at that time, the conversation really centered around reimagining public safety or reimagining police. And, and Dave and, and, and a few of us and others, you know, we, you know, through conversations with many community members, you know, we wanted to reframe that conversation because we really think it's more than just reimagining public safety or reimagining police. It's really about reimagining community safety. Uh, and, and although police, it plays a significant role within public safety, as we all know, but we also know that there's other segments of the community that also play an equally important role in that community safety. And so we really wanted to take this opportunity to really broaden this conversation Right. So, yes, we will address head on specific police related issues, but we also want to frame this in the context of how do we ask different question, questions and create a different system around community safety that involves non traditional community stakeholders uh, in a more intentional manner. Um, and so with that in mind, that, that's what that's what we presented the council, the mayor and council unanimously supported that direction. Um, and then uh, that kind of formalized this effort, right? And we kind of sequenced it. Uh, first and foremost, we wanted to make sure that we, we completed the, uh, the selection of, a, of our new police chief. And again, uh, congratulations, Chief Mata. He's here with us, um, you know, our, our, our new police chief. And, and, and it's important because the, as we all know, the police chief plays such a key role in a lot of this work, right? And in fact, uh, Chief, uh, I'm going to kind of go off script a little bit here, and, and if you'd like to say a few words, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're more than uh, welcome to. Thank you, Angel, uh, and uh, it's good to see everyone here. Uh, a lot of familiar faces. Uh, thank you, uh, and as Angel and the city manager Matt mentioned, uh, this work is uh, involving our community, and uh, we are committed. I am committed to working with you all, uh, not only in this, but in any other future. Uh, issues that we need to address uh, to make our services uh, better uh, and 
also to help our communities be, be safe. So uh, I'm excited about this uh, work, um, uh, working with you all uh, to uh, move this department forward and move this profession forward. Um, and I know uh, together we're gonna make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, and, uh, and again, congratulations. Um, and so, so that's that's kind of the background and the context. That's how we got here. Uh, we, we, we th this will be a uh, a six month ad hoc group, right? So our goal is not to kind of you know take over your entire life. Uh, we recognize that everybody around this you know the, the Zoom uh, is not looking for more work because you're all already you know leader leaders and 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 pretty pretty booked. So again, we, we, we thank you for being with us. Um, but what we'd like to do is over the six month period, our, our goal is to meet about twice a month, uh, roughly an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, and any additional meetings that you all feel are necessary to either do additional research, to do additional, um, you know, should there need to be some additional vetting of different issues, then, uh, but we'll leave that strictly up to you. So we're trying to kind of create a kind of a, a, a minimum. Um, but still leave some flexibility uh, for you all to meet more if, if needed. Um, and then, you know, the goal is that at the end of the six month period, you know, we provide some recommendations to the mayor and council. And, you know, I, I, I kind of want to manage some expectations. You know, I, I really don't see, we, we really don't see this as a forum where we're going to address all things police reform, right? We, we have a police reform work plan that we have. Our assistant city manager, Jennifer McGuire, drives that work plan in coordination with the police department. You will get a copy of that as well. A lot of traction happening on that track. We, we can definitely keep you posted on that as well. But this is really about kind of framing, you know, trying to get some, some real laser focus around three, four, maybe five max kind of issues that you know, within the context of reimagining community safety, what are things that we should do? And act on now, you know, and and uh, so I kind of want to manage the, that that part of the expectation. Um, and then the other thing I I, I want to say is this: is that we've also created some flexibility here. That if there's an idea that comes out of this group that we could move on now, we don't have to wait until six months to to provide that formal recommendation. If there's something that we can figure out in the next two three weeks, and it, it's it's ready for for you know. For approval, then we'll frame it and we'll we'll present that to the mayor and council sooner uh, than later. Um, and so I just want to let you know that again, you know, we want to kind of err, err on the side of taking action, uh, not so much process and 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 the six month timeline. Um, so with that, let me shift over to kind of the preliminary kind of overarching goals that that we anticipate. And if we could, um, Suma, if you could share the screen on that. There's four overarching goals that 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 we're hoping to achieve through this process. Uh, the, the first one is really a framing one and it's really creating a shared vision of community safety, right? I mean, the, the term reimagining community, reimagining community safety, pretty vague, pretty general. Quite frankly, also often overused, uh, you know, it's being used a lot nationally. But what we want to do is we want to put, kind of create a definition a la San Jose, right? We want, to, we want to create a shared vision of community safety. So then that becomes the framework that then guides and informs the work that we do as a group here. The second overarching goal is to um, engage community. The, the next two, by the way, are more process oriented, but uh, to engage community stakeholders in a dialogue and community process um, that, um, hold on a second. <clears throat> that evaluates and recommends uh, new ways in which the police department and non-law enforcement uh, sectors um, deal with social issues uh, that reduce social conflicts and that tend to be non-criminal in nature, right? So we want to take a, take a deeper dive on, on those and really take a look at things like calls for service and take a look at uh, uh, officer-initiated uh, re responses and really take a look at how we are deploying police resources and then ask the question, is there a better way to address these issues? Is there a better way of addressing these issues in a way that we could redirect you know, behavior, that we could uh, provide uh, uh, wraparound services for those that need it and so forth, right? And so uh, again, the operative goal there um, is, is really looking at um, new partnerships between uh, law enforcement and non-law enforcement sectors. Uh, the, the third one has to do with 
uh, carrying out an effective and inclusive community engagement process that is transparent, uh, that yields high participation, uh, not only by members of this group, but also to the extent that we need to reach out to the broader community, that, that we, we maximize that. Uh, and that we ultimately build strong and sustainable relationships and partnerships between the community and the police department, right? This isn't about just, you know, basic meet and greets, having a little barbecue and then, you know, passing out, you know, this is about really engaging and, and, and forming partnerships that are sustainable, that are relationship based, right? Relational community policing, um, if, if you will. And that would be one of the other uh, anticipated outcomes. And then the last one is really around generating recommendations that enable the vision of community safety. So we don't only you know, want to define what it is, but we want to come up with recommendations that are that we can implement, that we can operationalize and become part of the culture and the way we do things in San Jose. Uh, so those are the four uh, overarching goals that we have. So let me just stop there um, and, and just real quickly ask, are there any questions about the context or the goals before we jump into uh, the, the next part of the agenda? This is Hector. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Would you be able to send those out just so that I have them as a reference point when, whenever we meet, you know, so that whatever comment or perspective I bring, it's in the context of the goals that you just laid out. That would be appreciated. Thank you. Absolutely. In fact, everything that we present, we'll be able to send out and we will send you the slide deck and, and uh, yeah, sure thing, Hector. And Joe, this is Walter Wilson. Uh, can someone change my name from Dave Sykes? Because I think I look a little bit better than he does, but, you know. Walter. Or are you listening? To, see, I, I don't even see. Let me, I, yeah, I was going to say, Walter, what, what are you doing taking my name? <laughs> hey, you know, well, they, they sent me the wrong link. And I think yeah. there's people who are also um, attendees who should be in here who uh who, who don't have access as well. <clears throat> but um, I just wanted to say something, um, Angel. So, you know, I've been on panels like this before. I've been on the Sunshine Task Force and many other things where you have a broad cross section of people from our community. And, you know, we spent hours, months, weeks coming up with ideas and, um, and eventually coming to some agreement. And these are people from the left, from the right, conservative, you know, whatever. Everybody was part of was part of it. I'm specifically talking about the Sunshine Task Force. I think Dave Sykes might have been around at that time. <clears throat> but when we brought those decisions to the city council, especially around Sunshine, they voted it down. So I'm just telling you straight up, everybody here, I'm telling everybody here, this is this is great that what we're doing, but we've done this before. And every time it comes to the police, when it gets to the city council, and I don't, you know, and this has been like across the board. It didn't really matter which way the council went. You, you almost unanimously, if the police department was against it, it didn't happen. So, you know, Dave, you're the city manager. So, you know, how, how are you going to keep from wasting our time? I mean, I'm, I'm just being real about this. Yeah. You know, when you guys ask me to do this, I'm like, really? Another one of these? Are we going to do some serious work and bring about serious change? Or is this the same as stuff that we've been doing for the last 25 years? Because I've been on plenty of these mm -hmm. and people have done great work and it gets to the city council and it goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. And especially about Sunshine, about opening up the police records so we know who these officers are, what their backgrounds are, what we're going to do about the things that they do and, and their police arrests. I mean, this, that's just basic. So you're talking about reimagining. Let's reimagine culture. Let, let's reimagine the culture of the police department. But more importantly, the city's got to change. Mm -hmm. The administration must change in order for any of this stuff to happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we're going to start off, let's start off being real and honest about what's happened in the past versus how this is going to be so different moving into the future. I, I'd like somebody to tell me how this is different, please. Right. Well, well I, I appreciate that, Walter. And I totally I, I respect that perspective. And, and I could even relate to it to, to some degree. Um, but I will tell you this, uh, I, I'm not, I wasn't involved with Sunshine. I wasn't involved with maybe some of these other things that you were a part of. All I can tell you is this, is that from a city standpoint, we are resolute about wanting to advance positive change that's gonna result to, in a safer community. And so I can't speak to the past. I can only speak to the, to the present. And you have my word that, um, you know, this is about, uh, you, know, you know, 
pulling together the right people, framing the right issues, it, it, you know, having candid conversations. It also means we have to manage ourselves in terms of our own agendas and our own, uh, you know, so that we, we put our community first. And, and I think if we do that in, in the right spirit and we frame the right issues, we back it up with the right data analysis, with the right lived experience anecdotes that accompany them, then we could, we could uh, uh, advance transformative change. Um, so I know you're a little uh, skeptical and I get it. You know, I, I, you know, I, I, I get it. I totally understand the skepticism. I'm just gonna ask you to trust um, and, uh, and lean forward. That's all I can tell you. And if, if I could just add, Angel, yeah, so I, I certainly appreciate the comments, Walter. Um, you know, we've known each other for a long time. Um, you know, and I think, you know, so I won't try to say the same thing that Angel said, because I believe what Angel said was accurate. Um, I, I just will say this, Walter, we, we have changed over the years. We have. Um, and I've been, it's my 35th year with the city. Um, I, I've seen a lot of changes that we've done, um, but we're not going to hide behind what we've done. <laughs> We are gonna look forward and talk about what we're gonna do. And, and I have confidence that, that what we take forward, you know, what we, what we do here, what we take forward um, as a recommendation, it will be coming from all of us. You know, the administration, the community, the police department, um, all of us, that's what's gonna come forward here. Um, now, I, I think you have some points there. Yeah, it's, you know, until, this, until the council blesses it and makes the final approval, then that's when we know. That's when we know. So absolutely, I agree with that. And it's, all, it's up to all of us to make that happen. I agree with that, but I just want to say this. When the POA has more power than the community, then we're wasting our time. So I'm saying straight up to you, right here, right now, Dave Sykes and everybody else, you can hear me. This is Walter Wilson talking truth to power. When we do this work, this work must be advanced forward. And the other thing I want to say to you is this, this panel right here, there's not enough young people on this panel. I know everybody here. That's a problem. There's not enough young people. A third of this panel should be young people. And I'm willing to step off to bring some young people on. Okay. Uh, all right, points, points well taken. We do have some good youth representation and we, we can always use more and uh, points well taken. Any other comments, questions about uh, background, context, framework, goals? Yeah, uh, I have a question. This is Peter Ortiz, uh, 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 East San Jose community leader. I have, uh, so I wanna thank Walter. Thank you for those comments. Those are really important. It's important for me to have that context as we go into this um, important discussion. I wanted to ask, um, it, it, cause I, I do know a lot of people here on the panel, but I don't know everyone uh, personally. Do we have representation of family members who have lost loved ones due to uh, police involved shootings because I think that as we engage these conversations there needs to be representation from those family members um, whether it's them on the panel or us conducting some form of session where we hear directly from those families uh, we can't I, I personally could not sign off on recommendations without making sure that uh, local families because we do have our local George Floyds and our local Breonna Taylors Right. Those those are I you know, I, I, I definitely advocate for rec remembering their names, but also we need to list the names that have uh, lost their lives here locally. Yeah. 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 Good question, Peter. We do have several people on this panel here that, that have lost loved ones to to. Um, uh, yeah. And, um, and and we also had one person in particular that at the last minute had to drop off because of a schedule uh, scheduling conflict that was going to be joining us on this panel, uh, a referral that we received from debug. But um, so we, we do want to find uh, another replacement for her. Um, but yeah, definitely points well taken. And that's a very important perspective in all of this. Thank you. Yeah. Angel, they love loved ones to who? To what? I mean, we have to be able to speak, speak we, in space. Lo 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 speak lost, lost loved ones to uh, police uh, action as well as community violence. Thank you. Uh, that's, yeah, I'm not, yeah. Um, Okay. Any uh, any other? All right. So why don't we go ahead and why don't we go ahead and move on um, and into what I think is probably what the, you know probably the most important part of this, which is <clears throat> really the um, kind of the process of building you know our, our community around this, right? And and again, many of you know each other, uh, some of you uh, do not, and and so we we, we want to take um, you know sufficient time to 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 get to know who you are. Um, and, and the way we want to approach it is, you know, obviously this is a large group. So if you could take, you know, uh, a, a, you know, a minute or two, 
to introduce yourself, um, point out whatever it is that you want to point out about yourself, whether it's your organizational affiliation, your, you know, however you want to handle that. But then kind of address this point. Uh, what does reimagining community safety mean to you? And, and so we're going to be taking that information, not only to get to know you better, but we're also going to be uh, transcribing that information because it's good, it'll, it'll begin to help inform work later on around the defining uh, community uh, uh, safety, right? And so we'll kind of use it kind of from a twofold perspective. So with that in mind, we'll go around. Now, here's the thing about Zoom is that um, I'm going to just go, I, I'm just going to call on people around the screen. And I know some days it shuffles, so I, I might, you know, mess up a little bit because of the shuffling. So just at the end, I'll kind of do a, a kind of a final call for anybody I may have missed, but uh, just want to apologize in advance because uh, I, I know this starts, you know, shuffling like the, the Brady Bunch game. But so we'll start with Peter because I have Peter first on my screen up here. So, so Peter, let's start with you. Uh, thanks. Uh, so once again, my name is Peter Ortiz, um, East San Jose community resident, and I serve on that County Board of Education. Um, Reimagining Community safety to me um, means engaging all stakeholders, uh, like I mentioned, family members who uh, are, are survivors of police violence, while also including um, police officers in the discussion, um, but uh, identifying ways in which we can um, find alternative resources uh, for first response, especially for situations like mental health crises, uh, because majority of the police involved shootings happen in response to mental health crisis and I, I personally feel like um, we need to be having community-based organizations and um, you know uh, trained uh, uh, resources uh, be the solutions to those calls thank you why don't we move to Jenny Doe um, hi, thanks for this uh, opportunity. Uh, I am an executive director for Friends of Prey Foundation. Um, I'm an attorney and also a community activist. Uh, I work and serve the Vietnamese community in the past um, 20 some years. Uh, Reimagining um, um, police uh, uh, force, I would, uh, the way I see it is that to bring the police uh, officer and practice closer to the community, um, activate uh, volunteer base to work closely and uh, with the, the police department to to uh, fill the gaps and um, get both sides to understand each other. I also worked uh, with the San Jose PD uh, in the past in the gang uh, task force and um, I really understand a lot of officers have to go through each night when they have to go out um, and but I, I don't think that the community understand that. But at the same time, I don't think the police officers understand the community where it meant to be. So I just feel that there's a lot of misunderstanding on both sides, and we need to work together somehow to bring to bring um, the to bring closer the understanding between the the, the police department as well as the community leaders and uh, the community uh, residents. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jenny. Uh, we'll move on to Captain Captain Tall. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Jason Ta. I am a San Jose police captain. I've been with the department for 25 years. Uh, what community safety means to me is, uh, and it's, I think it's going to be a recurring theme for all of us here. It's looking for better ways to solve community concerns. I, I uh, like I think many of you, would like to see some of these concerns be handled in a way where it didn't become a, uh, is it a rest situation or a citation situation? It's, it's something that I'm hoping that out of this group, we can talk about those other alternatives, how we get to some of these root causes, how we as the police department can be that binding agent to actually bring communities together so they get to know one another in a better way instead of having to call 911 for a noise complaint. Um, my hope is that, you know, communities get to know one another because of forums like this or physical forums when we get out of the virus um, lockdown and really get to know and respect and trust and, and love one another and, and solve those problems in, in a more uh, respectful way without having to, to call the police. So I, I would hope to see that come out of these discussions. Thank you. Um, Hildy. You're on mute, Hildy. 
Thanks, Angel. I'm Hilde Chandel. I'm the co-founder of a group by the name of Ignite Justice, which brings together um, CEOs here in the Valley that's trying to uncover systemic challenges that impact police community interactions and is trying to work with the community and the city and the department to try to bring solutions that uh, embrace collaborative working together and both from the business sector, the community and law enforcement. Um, and echoing some of what Jenny said and um, Jason as well, we have been looking at and think that reimagining community safety can first of all involve bridge building between the community and law enforcement in ways that recognize trauma on both sides and then help to build trust and also ways that look at the impact of, um, of law enforcement on the community and think about how there are ways of looking at it that reduce that impact on whether it's in the juvenile sector or other sectors as well. All right, thank you, Huli. Uh, Sparky. Hi, Sparky Harlan, CEO of Bill Wilson Center, probably primarily known for my advocacy on the juvenile justice and homeless youth side. Um, Yvonne Maxwell and I have been working on a behavior health contractors association effort to reimagine first responses in the community that don't include law enforcement or county. And I have to say we've managed over the last eight months to get 25 million from the county for an innovative program that is going to be half of it for 95112, 116, and 122. But there needs to be more done as far as community outreach. We have community collaborators. But in the 70s, I used to do this in-home response. And I think what's happened in the last 50 years is that the community has sort of forgotten that we can take care of our own. And we've had this over-reliance on law enforcement. An example is one of my neighbors downtown. I'm on this email list and suddenly she's talking about some man looking in somebody's house and stealing fruit off the porch. So she said, I'm calling the police. And I'm thinking if I was there, I would have just walked over to the guy and said, hey, what's going on? Can I help you? What's up? And we, we've so learned just to call the police that we need to retrain ourselves. And I'm hoping that this group can look at that large program that we're designing with a lot of focus groups um, and help build on that and really retrain ourselves and our community to handle a lot of these um, first responder calls. Thank you, Sparky. Uh, so we'll go to Jim Carter. Uh, thank you, Angel. Uh, I'm Jim Carter. I'm the current chair of the Neighborhoods Commission. And uh, my background is that I've been the chair of the Neighborhoods Commission for the past year. I was vice chair before that. Uh, what public safety in the community really means to me is listening to our neighbors. The Neighborhoods Commission is a representation of the neighborhoods associations. We have two commissioners per district. And what we bring to the table are concerns really from our neighborhoods regarding public safety, budget, code enforcement, and transportation. So I'm really privileged to be sitting on this uh, panel and uh, have the opportunity to really voice an opinion and a voice from our neighborhood associations. And what that means is really, as I said, listening to our neighbors and what their concerns are, everything from police violence to fireworks and everything in between that. So uh, thank you, Angel. I just hope that uh, as was stated before that the council does listen to our recommendations and they move forward with that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Chief Garnett. Hi, good afternoon. It's great to see everyone and thank you so much for inviting me um, to be on this. Uh, so I'm the chief probation officer. Um, we have about a thousand employees and we serve both adults on probation and juveniles on probation and um, serve as the um, clearinghouse for all juvenile arrests that come into the county. 
Um, and then we run two juvenile detention facilities, a juvenile hall and a ranch, a short-term ranch. Um, my idea of community safety is one that it's evidence-based and, and not in a, in a hokey way, but that it's actually scientifically based on, on prior successes and that it's inclusive in a way that isn't just getting community voice and do you incorporate community voice and do we have enough young people? I mean, just, we can do this forever, but like the recognition that we're all part of the community, whether we're a police officer, an advocate or somebody affected by the system and that we have to come together with similar goals and and will um, to make it better because it's broken and, and we need to acknowledge that and make it better. So I'm excited to be part of it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Walter Wilson. Um, yeah, I'm Walter Wilson. I'm a community activist. Um, I've been here in San Jose for 47 years. And um, yeah, well, you know, community safety looks to me like it looks in Almaden. You guys know how you act in Almaden. All you officers right here know exactly how you act out there. That's what community safety is. Conduct yourself the same way in the east side San Jose and the poor and disadvantaged communities in the downtown area that you conduct yourself out there. Treat the people down here with the same respect that you treat those people out there. And, and most of these officers, the captains, the people here, you guys have talked to me before, and I've told you this. You know who the bad officers are in the police department. You know who they are. You've been working with them for 20 and 30 years. You know who the officers are that's going to kick somebody in the head because what for whatever reason is unnecessary. You guys know who they are. You want to change the police department? Start looking at yourself. I mean, we know what the problems are. All of us, we know what the problems are. But internally, you know better than any of us will ever know. So if you're really serious about bringing about change, you guys need to start looking at the people around you and holding them accountable to how they treat people in the streets. All right, thank you, Walter. Uh, we'll go over to Maritza Maldonado. Hello, everyone. Um, Maritza Maldonado, founding executive director of Amigos of Guadalupe, Center for Justice and Empowerment. We lead with our justice and empowerment work. We're a place-based agency in East San Jose, a lifelong resident of East San Jose and represent uh, in our zip codes that the largest um, immigrant community. So I want um, having seen firsthand uh, the racial profiling that has happened in our community and, and looking for solutions and having um, researched some of those solutions and, you know, being part of um, uh, writing the actual towing policy that uh, when we heard that our folks were were being, uh, the, the vehicles were being towed and couldn't get them out for, for 30 days. And we found out that the tow company was the one that was winning and, and so forth. So what I, for me, it's really important that we uh, look at different and uh, research-based best practices uh, in terms of, of uh, lifting up our whole community, um, look at, uh, eliminating the power imbalance. Uh, so when someone is, is carrying a gun, um, it's, it's a very different uh, power dynamic. So, so trying to work on that. Um, and then uh, more importantly, um, just to lift up that our Latino community, our Latinx community has lived in tyranny for the last four years um, and in real fear and has cr uh, created a lot of psychological um, damage towards our, our folks and, and having been a founder of the Rapid Response Network as well, it actually started here at, in our office, um, really lifting that, that piece up as to just the healing and, and making sure that our officers are quite sensitive to, to those uh, dynamics that are continuing to exist in our community. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Maritza. We'll go over to Poncho. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Poncho Guevara, and I have the honor of working at Sacred Heart Community Service. Um, and uh, I think when I think of this question, Angel, I think the three things that come to mind are, number one, a recognition of the legacy of systemic oppression, which is really brutalized and dispossessed uh, generations based on their race. Um, gender and immigration status of many people in our community and communities all over the country. 
The second is um, that our systems need to be reoriented towards putting people in relationship with each other. And that includes not only systems, but resources and policies um, so that people are in relationship with each other. We can, we could achieve support and healing to create a system that's better than what we'd have and correct against historic injustice. And the third is that the community voice of those directly impacted by systems are heard, centered, and imbued with the power that they continue to bring each and every day. All right, All right. very good, powerful. Um, Jessica, Ellen. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> my name is Jessica Nallin. My pronouns are she and hers. I'm executive director at the Young Women's Freedom Center and a co-founder of the Sister Warriors Freedom Coalition. And I've been working for the past uh, 20 years to build a collective power of cis and trans women and girls, um, gender expansive young folks of color who've been incarcerated and lived and worked on the streets. Um, and when I think about what public safety means, community safety, um, agree with what many folks said, I think that we have to um, really reframe our ideas around public safety, moving away from the protection of of, of wealth and property, um, but really looking at the experiences of those most impacted by interpersonal community and state violence and, and really lift up what community safety means to them. Um, why folks feel the need to carry a gun. Um, we just did a survey in Santa Clara County with young people who were um, systems involved. And we found that more than 50% of, of young folks had um, have had to engage in the underground street economy during um, COVID. And we know that leads to incarceration. And so we have to like address the structural drivers and take a transformative justice approach um, to community safety um, uh, rather than just criminalization. And um, another thing from that survey and what we found in our work across the state is um, it, really listening to, to folks around what they want and what um, safety means to them. And that doesn't just mean incarceration and arrest, right? Folks want violence to stop. Folks want ways to heal together. And so I would just hope that um, we could really lean into that in, in, in this uh, work together. All right, thank you, Jessica. Uh, Hector. Buenas tardes, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Hector Sanchez Flores. I serve as the executive director of the National Compadres Network, a nationally based training and capacity building organization based here in San Jose. I've been a resident here in San Jose for 21 years and um, here with uh, raising my family with my wife, Lucy, a uh, son who's left college and a daughter who's starting high school next year. So I have um, an interest in this committee. And when you think about what I envision about community safety is, um, I've seen communities that didn't have the kind of resources that the city of San Jose has to invest in policing and the solutions and how they address their issues about safety and protection, completely different when you don't have millions or hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of dollars to address it. Many of the people have alluded to some of those things here, you know, about how you engage the community. But I will say that in my experience, it's... Um, Community safety requires, uh, and, and I don't want to express what community safety means to me right now because I really want to know what the community feels about this. But I do know that it creates, it, it's needed, there's a need for reflection about the root causes of what has gotten us to this point. And, and we've been polite about it, but there's uh, white supremacy, racism, bigotry, systemic oppression. All of those things are the, are the, are the issues that confront us in order for us to envision what a community may feel like. And, you know, I, I don't believe that all communities interface with law enforcement in the same way. Mr. Wilson highlighted that perfectly. And the question is, how is it that we get uh, the transformative efforts also rooted into the police force? Thank you. Um, Diane Fisher. Hi, I'm Diane Fisher, um, Director of the Jewish Community Relations Council. I've uh, been doing that work for the last 15 years. Um, it's a um, network of all the Jewish organizations in Santa Clara County doing work to build relationships um, across different cultural groups and with government. 
um, coming from uh, the faith community here today, and I know there are others on this panel similarly, uh, bringing like a religious framework, I, I think about how the police department should have um, a rehabilitative and restorative justice focus. And, and I think that's um, something that we can improve on. Um, and as been said about the root causes, I think we should not be afraid to look at some of these very larger equity issues around education and healthcare, which actually really go a long way to creating um, community safety um, when there's greater equity. And then um, again, as like minority population um, here amongst many other minority populations, better tracking of hate crime and better training to truly know and have cultural competency with all the diverse groups uh, here uh, would be something that would make a big difference in community safety. All right, thank you, Dan. We'll go over to Judge Lucero. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Catherine Lucero, the presiding judge of the juvenile court. I like everything I've heard today and I ditto and um, I'm sure that we'll get an opportunity to talk more later. Uh, thank you. All right, Judge. We'll go over to the Chief uh, Tony Mata. Thank you, Angel. So um, I've been with the San Jose Police Department for uh, 25 years. Uh, and on Monday, I'll start as your, uh, your new chief and uh, resident of uh, San Jose as well. So um, community safety to me means that uh, the police is not always required. Uh, a police response is always required to um, issues uh, in the community. It also means to me that uh, we need to work with uh, all members of the community to find solutions to social issues, as it just been mentioned, education, health, recreation, economic, and violence. And uh, finally, uh, that what it means to me is that the police department needs to be a, needs to do a better job uh, of being involved and engaged with our communities in, in positive ways. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll go over to uh, Dr. Scott Myers Lipton. Hello, I'm Scott Myers Lipton. By the way, my name is spelled incorrectly. It's M Y E R S. My wife, who that's part, her part of the name, would 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 ask and demand that I ask that change. Right. Um, no worries. Um, I am a lifelong resident of San Jose. I, I came here at four years old and I've lived all my life here except going away for graduate school and uh, lucky enough to come back to the town that I grew up in. Um, and my mom was of course thrilled when I came back and I, I'm a teacher, a professor at San Jose State University. I've been over there uh, 20 years plus. Um, I teach I have many classes, but the one that I'm most passionate about is a class on social action, which teaches students how to bring about change. And we have fought for many social justice issues here in the community, along with many of you, with Poncho and many others around the minimum wage, which my students came up with that idea um, and, uh, and then have, have worked on the homeless question on our campus. 13% of our students experience homelessness. Um, and uh, it's a major issue. And my students have been involved in coming up with solutions. We now have 12 emergency beds on our campus because of the students' efforts, plus a couple million dollars for rental assistance, emergency rental assistance. Um, I'm also um, working on, as some of you might know, on the Silicon Valley Pain Index, which came out last June. It'll come out again this summer, which documents the outrageous inequality levels that are here in Silicon Valley, in San Jose, um, particularly on wealth and, um, and income inequality. And I would add to my piece about what is community safety is ditto to what so many with Peter and what Walter and so many have already said, Diane, um, my addition would be, you are not, we are not gonna have community safety as long as we have institutionalized white supremacy in our, in, in throughout all and, and you know, of our institutions, as well as this incredible wealth income gap, just not gonna happen. And that idea has been around sociology for a long time with high levels of inequality, you, you're gonna have a lot of interactions with the police and there's gonna be, so I'd say we have to decriminalize social problems and get at the root cause of these social issues that are facing our community. Thank you. All right, all right, thank you, Scott. Uh, Jennifer, love you. Hey everybody, I'm Jen Loving with Destination Home. 
uh, you know, people that are on our streets are over victimized, over enforced, over arrested, uh, least protected uh, with the farthest away access to power and also disproportionately black and brown people. So, you know, uh, if we can do a better job for people in those circumstances, we can do a better job for everybody in this community. But we have to start by solving uh, this for people that are truly farthest away from solutions. Thank you. Very good, very good point. Um, all right, uh, Maha. Hello, everyone. Um, and thank you for the invitation to be here uh, with you. So um, I am the founder of the Islamic Networks Group, which uh, is a community outreach uh, organization that's working on behalf of the Muslim American community um, around education and community engagement. Um, and part of that, of course, is police training that we do that's post-certified, um, and we've been doing it for 20 years. Um, I'm also a trainer for POST on hate crimes and culture diversity. So uh, hopefully I can bring the resources of POST to this uh, committee. And um, reimagining community safety uh, for me is when our most vulnerable members of our communities uh, can view and trust law enforcement as a partner in public uh, safety. A lot of us <laughs> are not, um, we don't have problems with law enforcement, we're here. Um, it's, it's the vulnerable members of our communities, I think that we need to be concerned about. I also think that law enforcement needs to do a much better job in public relations. I do a lot of work with law enforcement and I know that the vast majority of their work is non-combative, non-hostile, uh, or everything goes fine. Um, I don't know what the percentage is, is for San Jose PD, but I imagine that it's pretty high. Um, and so some research, I think for me, I would love to see what percentage of those cases have caused problems of the total cases that you, uh, that you handle on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, and then to hone in on what happened in those cases uh, to be able um, to help improve the situation. So that's what I have to offer. And I want to say congratulations to Chief Mata. One of the first things that I did was I introduced him to every uh, leader of every major Muslim organization in the area. So, so that community relations begins right away. And I think some people have written to him uh, directly. So anyway, so that's <laughs> All right, uh, and then why don't we shift it to Dr. Armelin. Hi, my name is Will Armelin. Uh, I'm the director of the Human Rights Institute at San Jose State University. Um, I work with uh, wonderful colleagues like uh, Dr. Myers Lipton, who spoke earlier, um, who's on our working group. And like he mentioned, we've worked on projects like the, the pain index and, and, and many others, including um, uh, policies at the state and local level. Um, and so I'll just kind of chime in with a couple of things. Um, first of all, I'm here in two capacities. Uh, I'm not just the director of Human Rights Institute, where my role here to some extent will be to inform this process with um, the highest human rights standards uh, available to us. Uh, and there are many of those kinds of standards that speak to issues of public safety, speak to policing, speak to issues of incarceration and so forth. And so I'm happy to share those as they become appropriate. Um, secondly, I'm uh, on the executive board of NAACP as the criminal justice chair. So clearly in that capacity, uh, I'm here uh, representing the interests of my organization and community. And um, in that light, I, I will say, uh, I'm real happy to hear the comments of uh, Walter and others, and I'm not gonna pretend like I can say them any better. So with that, um, I'm going to just sort of let it go and, and just say that I'm happy to be here with everyone and hope that I and we can contribute to, to um, get something done here. All right, thank you. Um, uh, next is uh, Dr. Rocio Luna. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is um, Rocio Luna. I'm the Deputy County Executive uh, with the County of Santa Clara and over the Division of Equity and Social Justice. Um, I think I echo what everyone has said to date. I really think about centering community at the center of all of this and of course, uh, all of you have already said that we have to acknowledge and walk through the really hard conversations around the legacy uh, of brutality of policing in communities of color 
until we do that, until that we can acknowledge, recognize, and uh, walk through that path, we will not get to community safety. Um, and again, I would love for us to think about um, uh, really thinking about upstream root causes because until we address the conditions in which our people live, uh, we will never really address the issues that come with policing. Um, until we do that hard work, uh, we are going to be sort of uh, batting ourselves up against a, a fence over and over again. So I'm hopeful um, and I, I uh, look forward to working with all of you. All right, thank you. We'll go uh, to Pete Carillo. Okay, I'm still trying to get uh, uh, up to speed on my technology here. <clears throat> Angel, thank you very much for for inviting me to uh, participate in the task force and um, listening to the folks uh, uh, that have come before me uh, this afternoon, it reminded me that just about every single issue that has been raised, uh, we've dealt with for the last, at least the time that I've been here for 47 years in San Jose, when San Jose was uh, a city with half a million people. Today we have over a million people. So for me, community safety is not just about police safety. It's about fire safety. It's about public works uh, uh, participating in creating safe neighborhoods. It's about environmental services as an example, creating uh, uh, a safe environment in our cities and, and in our neighborhoods. Uh, it's about environmental justice. It's about putting uh, <clears throat> uh, a focus on our planning department and making sure that they are creating safe uh, communities throughout uh, San Jose. So it's not just about public or police safety as far as I'm concerned, it's about uh, uh, just about every service that the, that the city uh, provides. And I'm so happy that our city manager is here with us today. And I hope that in subsequent meetings, we have you know, many of the department heads from the city of San Jose because they all should be contributing to community safety. And then one final thing that I would say that uh, as we think about, or as we get to the, to the issues relating to recommendations, whether we you know, do it in three weeks or in, or in three months, uh, we have to make sure that they are properly resourced. If they're not properly resourced, they're not gonna happen. And so I, I wanna make sure that we keep that in mind. So thank you very much for the opportunity to participate. All right, thank you, Pete. Uh, we'll go to Reverend Ray Montgomery. Thanks, Andrew. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Reverend Ray. I'm with PAC, which is People Acting in Community uh, Together. I come with the perspective of 30 plus faith communities and 100 plus clergy throughout Santa Clara County. Uh, the context of the experience that we bring um, centers around the work of the beloved community here in San Jose. Um, PACT is a part of a statewide organization called PICO with nine federations and a national arm called Faith in Action. Um, so through a moment of reckoning uh, and a time of listening, um, we are steeped in research um, that allows us to uh, identify um, not only historically, but presently, uh, the focus of what we need to become uh, in this moment. Uh, then shifting that to actions which center on holding stakeholders accountable, uh, particularly here in the specific district, since this is a, a council vote that will need uh, approval. So uh, moving into action, uh, away from dialogue, emotions and rhetoric uh, and optics so that we can create uh, this idea of a reimagined uh, public safety here in San Jose that will uh, serve to provide equity and justice uh, for all. So thank you, Angel, for the invitation. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll go next to Chava Bustamante. <clears throat> Hi, Angel. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Chava Bustamante, it's my name. 
And uh, I have, uh, I'm a founding member of Latinos United for New America. I served uh, uh, on this uh, organization as a vol full-time volunteer executive director until February of this year. But I'm still, um, uh, you know, part of the board of uh, Latinos United for New America. Uh, when, um, when I hear about um, reimagining community safety, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, uh, you know, thinking about the woman whose home has been burglarized uh, five times in the past uh, two years. And uh, she no longer believes that calling the police, uh, you know, will make any difference because uh, they respond one or two days uh, after the fact. Uh, I also think about uh, the people who uh, live in fear uh, and see the police more of a threat than uh, protection because they have seen their children, uh, you know, taken away from them uh, and then, uh, you know, um, uh, put them into, uh, into the system and, um, uh, and you know, uh, very seldom being able to uh, um, rescue or bring in, uh, you know, those children back to, uh, to the community. So I, I am very hopeful that uh, this um, dialogue, uh, I'm a big believer in dialogue. I, um, you know, and I'm hopeful that this uh, conversations will lead to ideas on how to um, solve some of those um, inequities. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's nothing I would uh, love to see uh, more than, uh, you know, uh, people really um, feeling safe when they are dealing with um, um, elements of the police department. But I, you know, also share Walter's uh, skepticism uh, when I see that uh, we are dealing with a divided uh, police department. Um, you know, these allegations that came out at the um, 11th hour against uh, Chief Mata. You know, uh, to me, they're nothing but uh, inside jobs. And so, um, you know, I'm afraid that uh, um, if we come up, not um, that if we come up with, um, you know, um, good ideas that uh, if the um, police officers association, you know, uh, uh, is in opposition to those ideas, um, uh, then what's gonna happen? So um, I am um, here, you know, and I'm hopeful, but. Uh, I'm also skeptical, um, you know, to a degree uh, about how effective these uh, recommendations are going to be in the end. Okay, understood. Um, all right, thank you, Chava. Uh, we'll go to Ruben. So, how are you? Uh, my name is uh, Ruben Solorio, and I'm the president uh, here at uh, Sacred Heart Nativity Schools in the heart of Washington. And I'm also a, a deacon in the Catholic Church, the Diocese of San Jose. Um, so my heart is split between being uh, raised and, and continue to live in East San Jose and the other part in the last, um, since 1998, when we opened the Washington and Adelaide Center here in, the, in Washington, behind La Biblioteca Latinoamericana. Um, my heart continues to remain here, thanks to Padre Mateo Shidi, who had this vision to break the cycle of poverty through education. And invested in bringing partners together to reimagine what this community could look like in partnership with, with the city and with, with the diocese and with the church. Um, and so I, I am really blessed to be here. Um, and, um, and I love to always be reimagining. I know Father Mateo would be here around this table uh, helping us reimagine uh, what a better community, a beloved community could look like. Without being too churchy, just um, what, what reimagining community safety looks to me, I can maybe just summarize it with the words of Father Greg Boyle in, from his book, Tattoos on the Heart, uh, where he says, no daylight to separate us, only kinship, inching ourselves closer to creating a community of kinship such that God might recognize it, soon reimagine re with God this circle of compassion. Then we imagine no one standing outside that circle moving ourselves closer to the margins so that the margins themselves will be erased. We stand there with those whose dignity has been denied. We locate ourselves with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. At the edges, we join the easily despised and the readily left out. We stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. 
we situate ourselves right next to the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. The prophet Habakkuk writes, the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, wait for it. Kinship is what God presses us on to, always hopeful that its time has come. And I think that's would be a beautiful moment to just think about reimagining a community of kinship. Mm. That's very, very powerful. I'll give you an amen on that one. Um, and and, I, and I, I, I knew Father Mateo, he was our, our, our pastor for a long time when I was a kid growing up. Um, um, wow, well, where am I? Uh, let's see here. I thought, let's see, uh, Darcy, Darcy Green. Hey, Darcy Green, um, lifelong resident at East San Jose and community health advocate. I'm also a, an organizer with a statewide network of women who've been impacted by the incarceration of a loved one. And when I think of reimagining public safety, I think of a process that allows us to thoroughly understand and research and also intentionally invest in the, the systems and the programs and the things that actually keep our community safe. And then a process of educating our community about what does and can keep our community safe and a recognition that that often isn't necessarily policing. Um, and that this process centers people and families who've been impacted by community and police violence and who also have been impacted by their own incarceration or the incarceration of a loved one. All right, thank you, Darcy. We'll go over to Gabrielle. Hello, everyone. I'm Gabrielle and Tolovich, and I'm with the Billy DeFrank LGBTQ Plus Community Center. And we are a 100% volunteer run, including myself. And one of the things that we have done around safety, because after gay marriage, you know, I felt there would be a backlash and there always is when there's a movement forward, there is always a backlash. So one of the things we've done is we have connected with the Alameda Business Association because we're on the Alameda. And um, by being involved with the Alameda Business Association, not only have we exchanged information about each other's businesses because a nonprofit is a business, I hate to tell everyone, um, but it has created greater safety. And what we've done is we share information about break-ins and robberies and, and what we see on the Alameda. And we have collected that information and then brought in San Jose PD, our captain. We've brought in our city council member, Deb Davis. We've brought in our um, supervisor, Susan Ellenberg. And as a collective, we have shared that information and we've had more traction that way because we work together. And that is really the message that wherever it is possible, because also the Neighborhood Association is part of all of that. And so we're connected with the neighbors, with the businesses and um, law enforcement and the elected officials. And so we are the ones that collect the information and then it makes it easier for law enforcement to know what to do. And um, one good example has been that um, you know, uh, it is a lot better, not necessarily perfect, but um, one of the things that in my um, previous work in um, substance use addiction and prevention is that there's all this talk about having mental health workers out there, but really a lot of the problems is alcohol and drug issues. And so, um, my wish is that, and my hope, I did call um, the Behavioral Health Board. Are you sure that there's been the cross-training between mental health and substance use? Because the two departments did merge. And substance use issues are big on the street. And those substance use issues play out 
um, late at night. And so mental health substance use workers need to be working with the police late at night, not between nine and five. So that's my little two cents around safety issues. The other thing um, I wanted to say is having a relationship with the captain on patrol, which we do, um, and that has been very helpful because we are the eyes and ears in the community. Um, and so we're able to share what we know, they share what they know, and we can work together. And um, one of the things that everyone can do is put their building on the stop program so that when trespassing happens, um, we are part of San Jose PD's stop program and then um, that makes it quicker to have trespasses taken away. Um, and we have experienced a lot of hate um, and because we're a nonprofit, we can say we are a private property. You know, we have a religious guy that keeps telling us we're going to hell. When we were open, um, you know, I was the only one that had the courage to say, you've got to get out of here. This is private property. This is not about free speech. And, um, and I have connected with the beloved community who has been very responsive when we've had um, the hateful religious people telling us we're going to hell because we're LGBT people. And um, I love the beloved community of religious people who fight for justice and um, love all minorities and really support us. So I love that. We have also um, worked with San Jose City to fight the um, hate graffiti that we have. So we actually now have queer murals on our dumpster walls and on our electrical box, thanks to um, our city council member who said, I'll sponsor it. Um, and it has stopped the hate graffiti and the anti-graffiti um, people are great. They wipe it clean, but I got sick of having to call them. <laughs> so now we've got beautiful murals um, that express more fully who we are. And our community feels that now we have outside space because we have to be closed for COVID. So there's so many different ways to create safety in San Jose. And um, I try and keep mindful of that. And I really, feel that what San Jose PD could do better is um, let the community know about the community service offices. They are the department's um, non-gun um, people who go out there and follow up on robberies. You know, when San Jose City was going to cut the police department, um, there was a move to cut the community service offices and the community said, no, we love them. They find the people who rob us. <laughs> they follow through on the paperwork. They are, you know, a wonderful bridge between us and the police department. We really don't want you to cut them. And because of the community response and because the community service offices do such a great job, they did not get cut. And I think they are the police department's um, best kept secret that people really need to know about and to utilize them a lot more and, ha and somehow do the PR about how to utilize them better because they really are extraordinary people that do great work for the police department. Okay, th thank you, Gabrielle. Um, and I, I do want to do a quick time check here because we're at 2.17 and we're, we, we're going to, until 2.30. So, and we still have about nine, uh, nine of the leaders to go. So just want to be mindful of your time. And um, so next we'll go to Tiffany Maciej. Hi, um, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. Um, I am the co-founder of Eureka Inclusive, which um, 
well, our mission is to de destabilize or demantelize. Oh, I know, I'm a little nervous. De uh, well, we we're really working on disability related issues. I'm also um, on the Human Services Commission, and as a member of the Human Services Commission. I led a look into juvenile justice involved youth with disabilities. So building on that work and what we found in the report we published, I um, hope to bring that element to this conversation and um, kind of build on what other people have said. I think that when, when um, oh, the, I'm forgetting names. So when uh, Deacon Solario talked about bringing people in and other people talked about looking at the avenues uh, outside of police and the gaps in our community that, that lead people down these paths. I think, honestly, you look at childhood and we have a lot of gaps in community services for our children, both within the school system, which it's difficult and complex. So we can't change the school system. Um, we don't have a children's hospital, so there's so there's a lot of things around that, um, and just recognizing that this idea of school to prison pipeline, it's for kids with disabilities, especially invisible disabilities that may or may not be identified at school, and who appear to be typical to most people. Um, they are most at risk. And those are the, the real gaps in our city and community services that I think I personally want to, to see reimagined so that we, um, we build an understanding of disability into our programs, policies, and the services that we have in place to support kids. And the idea would be don't call the police. Like let's let's not respond to the gaps in services. Let's recognize them and spend our resources addressing those gaps so that we don't marginalize children, we keep people in, and we don't we don't let them go outside the circle to begin with. So that's how I reimagine public safety. And I will thank you. All right. Thank you, Tiffany, for joining us. Uh, we'll go to Mika Stameta. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Micaela Estremera. Um, I go by Mika. I'm a public defender, and I am the president of the California La Raza Lawyers and immediate past president um, of the local chapter. Um, I am, uh, I'm sitting here listening to everybody talk about community safety, and I, and I guess I, I suggest we, we also consider flipping the question around and engaging in assessment and truth-telling about um, where the sense of of community danger uh, comes from. Um, what what are the things that, that deconstruct that sense of community safety? And, and I tend to think, like many have said, they're rooted in uh, inequity and in all forms of inequity, inequity in, in services and treatment and economic wealth and power, access to power, all of those things, certainly. Um, I think accountability is another core uh, issue. Um, obviously, a lot of people have touched on that, uh, particularly with law enforcement. Lack of accountability or the appearance of lack of accountability is, is, really, um, is really, really harmful to, um, to, to community trust and relationships. And then finally, finally uh, unity, I think, is a major component. Um, I, I really appreciated Ruben's quotation from Father Boyle um, and the idea of kinship. And I think the way that plays out fundamentally is that we, we, I see a lot of trends um, that essentially are aimed at identifying people that need to be pushed out of community, people who don't belong in community, people that need to be confined, people um, that, that just need to be shut out. And I think that we need to change the approach and start asking ourselves how folks who are struggling can be brought back into community, how folks who are sick can, can, be, can be helped to become healthy, how folks who are on the streets can be housed, um, and how we can have that sense of kinship because we build each other up and because we have that unity of community and that unity of, of pride in a single community. Um, and and I, I, I don't mean to be idealistic, I, but I, I really do think fundamentally um, those should be uh, kind of core principles of the way we approach solutions. Um, truth telling about the problem um, and having some real core principles that, that we build around the solution. So thank you for the invitation. I look forward to working with everyone over the next six months.
Very good. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Scott. Good afternoon, everyone. Scott Neese, Executive Director and Founder of the San Jose Downtown Association. We represent about 2,000 business and property owners in downtown San Jose. Chief Mata will be the eighth San Jose Police Chief I've worked with. That makes me uh, older than Walter. Uh, I'd also be willing to step aside if you're looking for some younger representation. What does community safety mean to me? It means the entire community feels safe. There's too much fear right now in our community. Fear of the police itself, fear of the mentally ill that are out on our streets. The pandemic has accelerated fear everywhere and, and fear that folks are gonna make calls for service and the police don't respond. All right, thank you, Scott. Uh, we'll go over to Protima. Thank you, Angel. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Pratima Pandey. I run the Office of Women's Policy for the County of Santa Clara, part of the Division of Equity and Social Justice. So I work for Rocio, who you heard from earlier. I want to dedicate my time and my introduction and participation to the lives lost in Atlanta two days ago, six of whom were Asian Pacific Islander women targeted because of their gender because of their race, because of persisting misogyny in our community. And what do I think when I think of reimagining safety? I think of scaling for diversion and not detention. I think of reform that allows our police and protectors to be guardians and not warriors. And I think of ensuring that we do not build reform on a single story, that each of our unique community stories are represented and heard, and our solutions are crafted to make sure our community can thrive and succeed. As a public interest lawyer, when I joined doing the work with, at, at the County of Santa Clara doing policy, one of the biggest parts of the story that I bring are all the clients throughout California that trusted legal aid and said, can you help me? And said, the solutions that I have had so far have not worked for me and here's why. So I hope as we begin this process, we remember to work with the community to bring their why to the table. Thank you, Angel. All right, thank you. We'll go over to me, Wynn. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the invitation um, for me to be here. I am born and raised in San Jose. Um, I am a member of the Vietnamese American Roundtable, the Vietnamese American Bar Association of Northern California, and I am a nonprofit immigration attorney in Santa Clara County. So um, my perspective really comes from working with the community and um, it's very community oriented. So reimagining community safety to me means building trust between the community and um, law enforcement. Um, which means educating the community on what law enforcement do um, and having open and transparent uh, policies and good dialogues between the law enforcement agencies and the community. Um, the second thing is um, I believe that uh, law enforcement should approach situations with cultural sensitive and racial equ equitable lens um, in dealing and understanding the community that they're working with. Um, so that means less policing of the BIPOC community, um, but more protection of those communities and less policing. Um, and also more representation in the force that look like the people of the community that they're serving and protecting. And lastly, um, alternative training. I, a lot of people have mentioned this and I just wanna echo it and reiterate it one more time. Um, having um, community partners address um, situations rather than having police um, go out to all calls um, that they think might be threatening. So having well-trained professionals go out to specific calls um, and de-escalating situations in, in the, those matters if it's non-threatening. Um, and I'm just here ready to work um, to build a safer community for all of us. So thank you for having me. All right, thank you, Mimi. We'll go to Dr. Uh, Kathleen Wong. I apologize for arriving late. Um, 
I would appreciate the opportunity. So for me, um, reimagining community safety for me in my interest as the chief diversity officer at San Jose State University, but also my area of training is really, um, I, I think in order to develop trust and imagining what safety looks like, for me, one of the bottom lines when I'm working with public entities is that they understand um, white supremacy and systemic racism, as well as systemic inequity on all different levels. So if someone is coming to you and they have to explain to you to validate that something happened to them, um, if they're spending a lot of their brain space trying to convince you that it's actually happened versus trying to seek help or, or have the, you know, the, the cognitive space to be able to describe what's happening to them and, and to relate, they have to feel that they, they have confidence that people are understanding things based on a historical narrative that's been going on for a long time. So, so for me, reimagining community is understanding that we're walking into a space that other people have created and shaped and reinforced as well as we enter it ourselves. So for many of our communities, we, you know, we think about our ancestors, we think about what happened to them. When I'm interacting, I'm thinking about how people treated my parents, yeah. not just me, how they treat my students, how they treat, you know, other people. So I think it's really having, having the ability to be transparent, to talk about these things and be able to call each other out is really critically important. And that requires a dialogue, not a kumbaya dialogue, but facilitated discussions that really address and unpack these relationships and power relations in a meaningful way. And I think if people can't do that, I think it's very hard to reimagine a joint definition of community that's I think needs to be constantly reinforced and constantly negotiated um, by community members. So that's that's what I want to say in terms of what I think a reimagined community looks like. Absolutely. Th thank you. Uh, and, and it does sound like we are going to go over a little bit. So hopefully you could stay with us. For those of you that can, we understand. Um, but I just uh, want to be mindful of that. Thank you, Kathleen. And so why don't we go over to Brianna. Brianna Brown. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Brianna Brown. I am a San Jose State student currently about to graduate. Uh, I'm also a student activist. So I am the president of the Student Homeless Alliance. I am one of the students kind of mentioned before that was involved in that housing initiative that got all of those programs kind of going for San Jose State. So that was really exciting. Um, I've been involved with kind of helping out with the Silicon Valley Pain Index on terms of like designing. Um, and I'm an artistic activist, but I've also been really involved with other racial equity campaigns, you know, throughout my activism journey. So that's a little bit about me. Um, now, in terms of what I think community safety looks like, I think it's being able to go into the most vulnerable communities and asking those people, do you feel protected and served? You know, if they, once they answer yes, I mean, you know, of course it's gonna be a lot more complicated than that, but giving that community voice is gonna be so crucial because a lot of times, you know, the community does speak. And, um, you know, I think a key part of being listened to is being for, you know, the, kind of all of us just to actually be able to like dive deeper into the roots and the origins of kind of why they're saying these things you know it's one thing to talk about racial equity but it's another thing to kind of you know educate others and dive deep into it and get into those difficult conversations you know i think um a disconnect might be you know up upholding some type of professional standard and speaking to the community you know on a face-to-face -face level so you know that hopefully what I would like to see is just kind of more transparency going between the community and between all of us so that we can really fulfill their needs. Mm -hmm. Very good. Th thank you, Brianna. Uh, we'll go over to Yvonne. Maxwell. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Angel, uh, for the invitation to participate. Um, my name is Yvonne Maxwell. I'm the executive director and one of the founding directors of Ujima Adult and Family Services that um, provides African-centered services to behavioral health and support services to the community. Um, and I think the best way I can, can say um, about reimagining uh, safety in our community is to quote Angela Davis that it's about shifting public funds to new services and new institutions who can respond to people who are in crisis without arms. It's about shifting funding to education, to housing, to recreation. All of these things help to create security and safety. And it's about learning 
that safety that is safeguarded by violence is not real safety. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, all right, um, we'll, we'll go, uh, oh man, this thing ships on me. Serena, we'll go to Serena. You're doing a great job, Angel. Uh, my name is Serena Alvarez. I am the pro bono executive director of the Institute for Nonviolence. Uh, we're a program of the human, Friends of Human Relations shared by Ann McEntee. It was founded decades ago. Um, by Jim McEntee and my father and focuses on structural violence, which up until a few years ago, people just like tilted their head and didn't know what I was talking about when we talked about structural violence. So I'm really grateful that that's now at the forefront. Um, we facilitate consensus building processes um, using interest-based negotiation for multi-systems change. I'm a native San Josean. I was raised in East San Jose. I've worked with four chiefs. I'm also wearing the hat as the California LULAC state board member and district 14 director here. We sit on the governor's creating safer communities task force. I wanna just make sure I share that with the team. That includes um, working with statewide stakeholders on input on the peace officer standards and training for post with the state AG um, and bring uh, hate crimes task force information to our local agencies. Um, and I'm also an advocate uh, with both of those hats on for systems change relating to historical preservation and interpretation, which is relevant for my image or reimagining, because from for, um, our perspective, the um, groups that I work with, advancing asset-based community capacity for fruitful living is what um, uh, we imagine. So the legacies of our valley, the history, working with the city manager's um, office and team with Angel, um, and Lee on Dr. Steve Peaty participating in our equity study session, um, presenting the history of white supremacy in our valley. And I wanna make sure I say this to the group, the benefit of it right now is that that for me is not just as a LUVAC member for Latino communities, but regarding the internment of Nikkei in our valley, the burning of Chinatown in our valley, um, that it's not just been about um, Mexican communities being oppressed, Latinos being oppressed in this valley, but that we have this um, heritage of resilience and survival of those oppressive um, regimes and um, we have histories to celebrate and work with national organizations who do that and work on reforms in historical um, circles. And that for me is what I want to work to reimagine is asset-based community capacity building. So i um, thankful for the time and keep it rolling, Angel. Thanks. All right. Th thank you, Sabrina. We'll go over to Fred Sibbury. Thank you, Angel, for inviting me into this panel. Uh, some of the people I do have uh, a lot of knowledge of and their commitment to getting things right for a change in this city of San Jose. Um, what, I've been a member of this city in District 7 for a little over 30 plus years. And um, I have two daughters and three sons. And um, I have to tell them how to act when they go out into the community, especially when they're being approached by law enforcement. You may say, why a father have to do that? Well, it's going across the country the same way, but still we see individuals being killed. Uh, it's also gratifying to see uh, the new chief on the panel with us. But I've sat here and listened to a lot of what's been said, and it makes sense. But if we're not willing to communicate, if we're not willing to hold a true and honest conversation to power, make a commitment to what we stand for, and above all, follow through with those commitments. Uh, Mr. Wilson brought up the POA, and you know what, he's right. We can sit here till we blew in the face with great is, and if they disapprove of it, it's not gonna happen. So I say this, you put in quality procedures, that's gonna more or less create maximum outcomes. They need solvers. If you don't know, say you don't know. Get the professional help in the police department 
that's going to be able to make those decisions. You know, we can go on all day long and our next meeting can be longer than this one, but you got to get back to the outreach in the community. Go into these schools. Explain to these children how and why you do certain things. That's basically about it for me for right now. I just want to basically listen and then make additional comments as we go along. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, we'll go over to Chris. Ariola. Hi, Chris Ariola with the uh, I'm a supervisor at the district attorney's office in charge of our uh, community prosecution and juvenile crime prevention unit. Uh, and I've been uh, in and he'd been around San Jose almost 25 years. And, uh, and I think uh, one of the things we got to look at um, is how we look at things. I'm also um, on the board of La Raza Lawyers with Mika uh, and on La Raza Roundtable board. But uh, the thing that strikes me is we don't know our own history. And I think some people have brought that up. Uh, people don't know the city of Milpitas was explicitly incorporated to keep out black auto workers. Um, that San Jose was home to the first Mexican segregated school in California in 1883. Um, we, somebody mentioned Chinatown as well. And really, we got to look at that and understand that um, and understand the redlining created East San Jose and it was a government policy. Uh, but once we acknowledge all that, we then have to look at our systems and our decision making points and decide how we're going to implement and change those policies, whether that's decriminalizing possession of marijuana, as the district attorney's office has done for first and second time possession, um, because it impacted a large number of men of color, whether that's requiring um, diversion on first time resisting arrest, um, how can we change the decision points that we have power over? And then lastly, how do we empower our communities that have been subject to historic discrimination for so long, um, what kinds of programs, for example, the probation program with the San Jose Police Department that Captain, then Captain Mata helped us run that helped empower that community and create a community group. How do we have more project hopes? How do we have more programs like we had at Overfeld High School with San Jose PD and the probation department to cut down on the number of kids incarcerated? And how do we keep that number down? So I'm really very interested in how this impacts juveniles and particularly uh, in the county and the city. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chris. We'll go to Siobhan. Very. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Siobhan Murray. I'm the current independent police auditor for the city of San Jose. Um, we're a, a, a board appointee. Uh, in general, we, we take a look at internal affairs investigations of misconduct. And we do that to make sure that internal affairs and the police department holds its officers accountable and that those investigations are fair, objective, and complete. Another um, major um, responsibility we have is to make recommendations to improve the police department. Um, we, uh, many years ago, were the entity that uh, made the recommendation that the department should purchase body worn camera. That's been a big uh, game changer for us in terms of um, confirming whether misconduct occurred. Uh, we, in 2015, we asked the department to ban chokeholds. Uh, most recently, we asked the department to put in better procedures to know who officers are pointing their guns at throughout our communities. Um, in general, I think when I think about community safety, I, I think about a community that feels safe and comfortable regardless of their socioeconomic status, their race or their gender, and that community members feel that procedures are gonna be applied in the same way no matter where they live. So you might have an outcome of an arrest, which is the outcome, but what about the process, the whole process of the encounter? How, how people are spoken to, uh, who, who gets pat searched? Um, when is a car towed? It's not just the outcomes that interest me, it's the whole procedure by which the outcome is, is arrived at. Um, that's my area of interest and um, I'm interested in, in all the other areas too, but that, that's currently what I'm bringing to the table. Okay, thank you, Siobhan. Um, Molly, Molly O'Neill. Sorry, 
Sorry, technical difficulties. Um, good afternoon. My name is Molly O'Neill. I'm a public defender for Santa Clara County. I've been uh, working in criminal justice in this office for going on 31 years now. And um, so I think my contribution to this panel, and by the way, Angel, thank you for including me. What, what an amazing array of community leaders you, you have assembled here. And thank you for taking on the difficult task of moderating um, such a challenging but important conversation. So be, because of my role and because of what we do, we, we represent oh, roughly 85% of all the people charged with crimes in the county. Uh, the majority of which come from the city of San Jose and are, are initiated by San Jose police. Because of our role uh, there, I, I, I think um, my, my primary interest is in, in a conversation around police reform and culture change, uh, echoing what many of you have said, everybody in every uh, city in the county should be treated the same regardless of their skin color. And I recall as part of uh, juvenile justice work being at, uh, on campus at Overfelt and hearing a young Latino youth say that every time he saw a police car in his community, his, his heart beat and he was worried about what was gonna happen to him. And, and I would like to see a community, a community where our youth didn't feel like that. So uh, I was happy to be following Siobhan also because I, I feel like part of the really important police reform work, it has to involve the independent police auditor having increased powers of investigation uh, and really increased access to information so that they can help us uh, get to that culture change. And finally, I would really like to see Having dealt with police officers and having heard stories for 30 years from our clients, I know that there are some police officers who are bad apples and there's some very, very good cops uh, on the San Jose department as well as the other departments. And so one of the huge problems with policing is that uh, good cops are silenced by the bullying tactics of the POA and of uh, by bad cops. And so until we have a situation where good cops can say, that's not right. The way you treated that kid when you, when you confronted him, uh, the way that you used violence in that, in that arrest, that's not okay. Until a good cop feels comfortable going to their uh, supervisors and, and calling that out, we're, we're in big trouble. So uh, thank you for including me in this conversation. And I look forward to our next meeting. All right, thank you, Molly. Now, based on my screens, I think that was everybody. Did I miss anybody? I wanna make sure I don't miss anybody. Okay, uh, okay, great. Well, you know, we, you know I, I think we're off to a good start in terms of building community around this issue here. Um, and, and I hope that that community just continues to intensify and build and, and, and it'll continue to grow, right? Especially as we identify others that need to join this conversation. Um, Clearly, a lot of good ideas to help frame our definition of, of creating a shared vision of community safety. Um, clearly hear the skepticism. I also hear the idealism. And I hope that if we do this right, you know, we, we, could, we, could, we could address that skepticism or at minimum let, let that fuel or offset it with some idealism to really drive things and move things. Uh, you know, we purposely set this up so that this group is advisory to the city manager. The city manager um, oversees all the city uh, departments, including the police department, including the other ones that were mentioned, public works, PRNS, you, you name it. Um, and that was done intentionally because uh, we are very focused on, on some transformative change. Uh, we know it's not gonna be easy. We know there's gonna be a lot of skepticism and well, invalid skepticism, but we also know that this is an opportunity to really um, advance these goals in a meaningful way if we do it right. So uh, I'm hoping that that we will, and uh, and I'm sure with this group, uh, you know, you'll, you'll ensure that that happens. Um, so we we had we had planned on hitting on on the proposed values and guiding principles and methodology. Swilma was ready to go on that. What we'll do is we'll take that up at our next meeting. 
Um, and so Suma, thanks for being ready, uh, but we will definitely, uh, 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 you know, start with that process. Um, I do very quickly before we end the meeting, I know we got to do a quick public comment. I don't see a whole lot of folks, but um, uh, I, I do want to acknowledge a few city staff people that were, that were also very helpful in doing a lot of behind the scenes work and getting this done. So Sabrina, Par Garcia, Sabi Kaur, Lori Severino, Gina Espejo, Kemet Mawakana, Olympia Williams, Suma Maciel, of course, uh, Delina Valientos, Stephanie Jane, Tim Manasala, Chantel, I'm not gonna try to pronounce your last name, Chantel, because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm gonna mess it up. Um, so I apologize, but I wanna give a, uh, let me see, yeah. I wanna give a quick uh, shout out to them because there was a lot of behind the scenes uh, legwork leading up to this. And so I wanna really uh, acknowledge them. Um, before we close out, uh, we do need to open this up for public comment since, since this is a public meeting. And so staff, maybe you could guide me on this. Uh, I guess I'll open it up for a public comment. And if there's anybody, uh, let's see. And then I'll go back to, I see Walter's hand up and I'll go back to him, but any public comment from any, uh, buddy from the public, I don't see any staff. Do you, do you see anything? I don't. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. Seeing none. Uh, before we, we close out, uh, I see Walter's hand is up and Peter's hand is up. Uh, so Walter. Yes. <clears throat> and thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so I have a question. Um, how is this, um, this committee going to be structured? Because you're talking about, it seems like you're putting the cart before the horse when you're talking about, you know, the things you plan on talking about next. I need, I'm, I'm trying to understand, I think everyone else might be interested in how this, um, I know you're moderating, but how's this committee going to be structured? Is, or is there is that open? Do you have some ideas? And that maybe, and maybe you don't have time now, but maybe you can send that to us and give us some perspective on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll try to hit the high points, but but really, the next meeting will will go into greater detail around that. We were very intentional about not to over prescribe either the structure or the substance of these meetings because convening all of you together, that was really the main purpose is, is to pull together the right people. Let's ask the right questions. Let's look at the right data and then let's tackle the right issues, right? So we, we, we didn't over prescribe. What we have come up though, is we are leaning on, we've looked at a number of different strategies that, that, that others are, that, that others are using uh, recommendations by the National League of Cities, uh, uh, recommendations by the Urban Institute over at the University of Chicago that is been doing reimagining work for about 12 years. Uh, John Jay University, Carol Mason over there doing some, some excellent work. Drawing on that body of work, um, we wanted to kind of frame some values and guiding principles, talk a little bit about methodology and process, and then uh, that, that'll then help structure the way we actually get work done. And so next meeting, we'll go into more detail about that. But those are proposed because what we want to make sure is that we, we enter into uh, a structure that works for this group. And at the same time, we don't want to use five meetings to debate all that, right? So we also want to make some decisions about pro you know, process, but we want to make sure it's the right process. Um, so more to come on that, Walter. And, and, and bottom line, we don't have it all figured out, but we have a rough framework so that we don't have to start from scratch. Thank you, Angel. Sure. Uh, let's see, I see Peter's hand is up. Peter. Thank you. Um, once again, thank you for uh, allowing us all to be on this board. Um, and for this important discussion. Uh, I have a question in regards to uh, what the announcement to the community uh, has looked like in regards to the formation of this board. I haven't heard many people talking about it. I know that this is something that I know a lot of community members in East San Jose will want to have their input on, show up to the meetings. So I wanted to see um, if there has been some form of press release or what, what form of press release there will be around announcing this board. Um, and, and two, do we have a date for the next meeting and will there be um, an agenda so that uh, all the, the board members can prepare talking points for the items? Thank you. Yeah, yeah great questions. Um, so no, there has not been a press release and, and I will tell you right now, um, at, at the risk of, of um, you know, being criticized for not a whole lot of like public notifi notification, even of this meeting, we wanted to start in a real genuine organic way by onboarding and convening uh, individuals. And then, uh, and then, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll formally kind of uh, uh, definitely from, from the next meeting on, we're going to definitely kind of cast a wider net in terms of, you know, letting people 
No, we're also this meeting, of course, is recorded also and will be will be posted. So if anybody wants to go back and take a look at it. But what we really wanted to do was start off with just onboarding and building community and then kind of growing it. Um, we weren't interested in making a lot of hoopla around, you know, th this wasn't about trying to put out a press release and doing sound bites about how we're, you know, th this is really about just trying to be genuine with respect to this. And so that's kind of how we're starting. Um, we will we, we will work in coordination with our, our city's PIO, uh, one to, to message to the community. So we will, we will do that. And then we also wanna give you the latitude to also kind of give some input as to, you know, um, notification in terms of your role. Uh, we definitely, there was an information memo that was sent out yesterday to the mayor and council explaining this whole process. Uh, we made sure that we didn't release anybody's name until you all confirmed with us that you were uh, a green light uh, to, to join us. So, in fact, we will send you that info memo. We will send you the slide deck that we have here. We'll send you the roster of, um, of, our, of our team, just so you have as a background. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll formulate the next agenda. We'll get that to you in advance as well. And then we'll go from there. We, so we have, we have scheduled the next meeting, which would be Friday, April 9th. Um, now, Gina from our team is going to be doing some polling around, you know, and, and of course, with a group like this size, it's going to be hard to nail down any specific one, but she's going to do some polling. And then we're going to try to get some meeting cadence down and then kind of schedule them all at one shot. So then that way you at minimum have uh, the ability to put those on your calendar or know which ones you can or cannot attend. Um, we will, uh, as I mentioned, record these so that if you miss a meeting, you can get that and our staff is also really good in terms of follow-up so if we have items that we need to share things that we think you, you may have missed then we'll also um, get that to you as well and then we're also hoping that the conversation continues in between meetings uh, between all of us that are that are working on this um, I think that's really the most salient you know I think uh, takeaway from there so uh, hopefully you that answer all your questions hey, well, Doctor, I, will the roster include all of our committee members and our information with one another yes Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. And you know what? And the Brown Act does not apply to us, right? But we're not sworn. Uh, you know what? I don't believe it. I don't believe it does. I will confirm to make sure. Uh, I, let me ask the Sunshine uh, Police on that. Uh, but let me check to make sure. Um, but um, I know this is considered a kind of a, a miscellaneous meeting because it's advisory to the city manager. And so it's less regulated as as the other you know formal commissions and all that so i don't believe it is brown act but let me make sure uh that my information is accurate walter thanks so you. we will get back to you on that Great. yeah good and good. Hill, do you have a time for the ninth uh yes on, on the ninth i i believe i believe uh, one o'clock on the ninth was the the time on that yeah yeah one to three o'clock on april 9th all right. Any Thank other? You. Yeah, no problem, Charlie. Any, any other questions uh, about today? Uh, and, and of course, if there's anything that comes up in between, feel free to reach out. Um, you know, you, you, you know, via email, cell phone, uh, whatever works, and we will do our best to get back to you. Um, I'm sorry, Angel. Did you say? Uh, just going back to my question, will we get a copy of the agenda before the yeah. meeting? Yes. Angel, I would actually like to see an agenda for all for all the meetings, if you can, if you could just uh, uh, give us an A to Z uh, overview of what is expected, uh, what kinds of things we're going to talk about. And I'm also really sensitive to what Walter and some other people have said about the value of this. Will this eventually get approved or rejected again by city council? And can, in parallel to the work that we're doing, could you also share with us work that you're doing internally with the POA? Because this is something that I've come across in all my years that, you know, you can do all everything, you know, we can have the best plan, but the union is gonna shut it down. Yeah. Um, and so if there's a parallel track uh, that's happening also to have these conversations with the city council and the POA, I'm imagining the city council is influenced by the PO because they fund them because I don't know, they finance, their campaigns or whatever, but it would sure be a huge waste of time, my time, everybody's time to be doing this and then end up not having it. I mean, we don't want any more cynicism in the community. It's already here. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I understand. We're here on, on good faith, goodwill. 
But if I involve the Muslim, the Arab American communities and say, you know, this is, this is it, this is going to, you know, we're after, this is post George Floyd and, you know, things are really changing and then, and then things don't change. Yeah. It'll be, I, I, it'll, I, it'll I, shut I, everything down basically. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. could completely understand that. I, I, I believe me, I completely understand that. Um, Mm-hmm. You know what? Let, let, let's lean in and give the, and trust this process. You know, I, I will say this: th- this group is not advisory to the POA. This group is advisory to the city manager, and uh, and I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. I understand uh, the nuances with that. Um, um, is the road going to be easy? Absolutely not. Uh, but I think if we ask the right questions, uh, analyze the right data, incorporate the right lived experience, and come up with uh, recommendations that are sustainable, resourced, and that makes sense because they're in the best interest of our of our community, then I think we'll uh, be on the right side of this. Um, uh, Andrew, but, is the mayor in support of this? The, the mayor, uh, the mayor, and the full council is in support of this entire the, process. The reason I'm asking you that is because when we did Sunshine, the vote that shot that down was the mayor's vote when he was on city council. That's why I'm like, really? Okay, well, we'll go <laughs> yeah. with this. Yeah, no, when we took this to council to present the process, because we actually presented this process uh, before um, we took this to the mayor and the entire council, and there was a unanimous vote in support of this of this approach. Because yeah. I believe if the mayor supports this, and we come with some real recommendations for change, we can move this thing forward. I, Thank I you, Walter. Uh, don't forget the agendas. If you can just have an, like an overview agenda of of what each meeting we're going to talk about, it would be really, really helpful to come in also prepared. Yeah, well. yeah. Uh, on that one there, we are going to need a little more time because we haven't we haven't really crafted every single agenda, mainly because we want really this group to also help inform and drive the agenda, right? So as I mentioned earlier, we don't want to overprescribe. We want to make sure that you know we're tapping into this group. But once we solidify that early on in the process. Um, we definitely are going to uh, map out this agenda through the six months, um, so then that way we know exactly what our pathway is. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I don't see any other blue hands here. Um, so I think I'm supposed to go to public comment, or did I do that already? Uh, have I? Did I do that? Okay. Uh, it's been a long, it's been a long year. <laughs> um, okay. So I, I think that's it. Uh, unless there's anything good to the order, I think that the meeting's adjourned and thank you so much for your time. And we-